Good morning, Village Church. Good to see you. Good to be with you. Yeah, come on out Saturday. It's a lot of fun. Amanda's in charge, so you know it's going to run well. We've got coffee and donuts. And um, if you haven't met, my name's Kevin, one of the elders here, lead pastor. So glad to be with you, continuing on in the series. And uh, just a second Joshua's Place reminder, uh, we are very connected to Joshua's Place here. And uh, we do our gala. Uh, it's a fundraising event. It's our single biggest fundraising event we do every year. It's coming up November 10th in about 10 days. We've got a few tickets left, so if you've never been, it is a ball. Uh, this year, we've continued on. We, we're doing a 80s theme uh, because we know the best decade for music was the 80s, right? And so uh, lots of fun. People dress up. Some do, some don't. But either way, you'll have a good time. It's for a good cause. Uh, and so uh, you can check out the Joshua's Place website for that. Uh, we're going to continue on uh, in our series. Uh, we're doing called uh, Rechurched, Finding Meaning, purpose, direction. This is a, a series about invitation. It's about us inviting our friends, our family, our co-workers, our neighbors uh, to be part of the faith community, the person of Jesus, and the community of faith, which is the local church. And we want to do it in a way, I've said this each and every week, so I hope I'm not being overly redundant, in a way that gets to the deeper issues. That we, we, we do not want to talk about Jesus uh, and church in terms of features and benefits, but I believe today, especially today, because things tend to be so superficial, so thin, uh, that I think people really want deep. I think they want authentic. I think they want real. And, and I have found all of that in my life only through the lens of Jesus, only through the teachings of the Scriptures. Have I found those deeper truths that have been time-tested and eternal. And so as we go out to share our faith, those of us who are of the faith community, we want to make sure we're doing that in a way that it meets people where they are and then not be afraid of those deeper questions. And so for us to answer those deeper questions or for us to talk about it, we've got to be experiencing it ourselves, right? And so this series is structured in a way that walks us through the two key parts of invitation and what it means to be a part of the local church, and what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. So this first part that's going to wrap up today is we're talking about the church. When you invite your neighbor to be part of a local church, and specifically this local church, these are the things that we're doing. These are the things that we structure our beliefs and our activities around, and we've used the acronym CHASA, uh, and uh, we, we, we've gone through each of the five letters. The C is that the church is a community, a place for us to belong. The H is that the church is a hospital. We're a place where broken people get better and find healing. Uh, the church is an army. It's a metaphor for us to, get to, to evoke the imagery of mission. The church is on mission. Talk is cheap. We've got things to do that there are people that need to hear the truth of Jesus. And there's suffering in the world that the church wants to be part of in terms of bringing help. Last week, we said that the church, was a, church is a school, and it was a discussion about, about, uh, about discipleship. But even bigger, it was, a, it was a teaching on transformation, that the church is a place where we come and change, that Jesus loves us the way we are and loves us enough to change us, and that's what we call the discipleship process, and we talked about the ways in which we are discipled here to be more like Jesus. And so today, we're going to finish up the discussion on what the church is. And Chasa, next week we're going to start over on the discussion of what's it mean to be a disciple of Jesus. So keep coming back for that. That's equally as important. But today we're going to talk about that second A, the final A, and that is that the church is an altar. The church is an altar. A-L-T-A-R. And, and like army, we're going to use altar in a metaphorical sense, okay? Because I, I'm, I'm going to guess here, I don't know this to be the case, but I would say the average person today, when you think about an altar, you may not have a lot of personal reference to draw from. There's not many of us that have seen the altar, certainly not the kind of altars that we see described in the Old Testament, right? In the Old Testament, we see that the Israelites would use the altar for several things, but kind of two key things, two key activities happened at the altar, and one would be that the altar was used for sacrifices, that the, the priest would sacrifice something for an atonement of, of sin, sacrificial there, 
but also for, for offerings. People would bring burnt offerings for, to celebrate festivals or to mark occasions. But, but in both of those things, whether it's the atonement of sin or the bringing of offerings, the, the altar, the physical thing where these, where these animals were brought and sacrificed and surrendered, these were things that the priest would, he would, he would give valuable things to God. The altar was at the center of that. As you head to the New Testament, we, of course, we start to see a transition about what the idea of an altar is because, of course, you've got to imagine here that the, that the change happens when there is no longer sacrifice needed for sin, right? So as we talk about what an altar is in the New Testament, we're informed tremendously by the work of Jesus. And I'll take you to the writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews 10, he summarizes exactly what we're talking about, about the change of what an altar is. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are the kinds of offerings you did not desire, talking to the Lord, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. And so he's outlining the fact here that that's the way we used to do the altar, but now something's changed. No longer is the law of what needed. Then he said, verse 9, here I am, I've come to do your will. This is Jesus speaking. He sets aside the first, the burnt offerings of the altar, to establish the second, Jesus doing the Father's will. And by that will, we've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ, hear this, once for all. And so I'm going to use the metaphor, the imagery, the picture of altar throughout today, but I want to start in, at the beginning of understanding that Jesus finished the need for the physical altar. That all that was done, we, we celebrate that here every day in communion. Every, every Sunday we come together, we recall the body that was broken, we remember the blood that was shed, the blood that atoned for the sin, and as we recall and remember what was done on our behalf, we're remembering that it's finished, that there's nothing else that can happen to it. So as I talk about the altar, I don't mean it in a sense that there's something else we need to bring to a physical offer and physical sacrifices, but that Jesus finished it. And of course, for the non-believer, for the unchurched, remember our, our audience here, it's, it's for the unchurched, it's for the de-churched, and of course it's for you. But for those who do not follow Jesus, that is the good news. That's the best news we can share with our friends and our family, our co-workers, our neighbors, and that is the sacrifice has been paid. That God desires a relationship with you, and although he's perfect and you're not, a price has been paid on your behalf, and it's once and done, nothing that you can bring to it needs to add to it. That is the good news. That is the message we invite our friends and family and co-workers to the person of Jesus. It's also good news for the believer as we recall that we are saved by grace through faith and not by works. And despite the fact that we've got a mission to do and we are working to bring the kingdom, there's nothing we do that allows God to love us anymore. It's all finished in the work of Jesus through his sacrificial atonement. So everything I'm preaching this morning is built on that truth of understanding. In the New Testament, the altar has been replaced by the finished work of Jesus. Now, in borrowing from this picture and this metaphor, that in our faith there are several tensions like this where we'll use an imagery or sometimes we'll use a paradox. And all a paradox is, and there are several of them in our faith, it's this kind of absurd idea that nonetheless is true, right? So a paradox, for example, would be Jesus says, in the kingdom the least is greatest. Well, that sounds absurd, but if you understand what Jesus is talking about, he's saying in the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, it doesn't matter how tall you are, how good looking you are, what family you were, written in, were born into, those things do not matter. In fact, it's the most humble, it's the meek that will inherit the earth. That's a paradox of our faith. Jesus also teaches about a paradox of generosity. He sees a, a widow giving a single copper coin, just a single mite. And there were others there that morning that were giving much bigger, much larger offerings. And Jesus gives another paradox. He says her offering is the biggest one of all in the kingdom. Well, why is that true? Because in the kingdom, in generosity, it's not about the amount you give, but the amount of sacrifice that comes along with that generosity. These are hard truths that as you understand the kingdom, 
as you get closer to Jesus, you go, yeah, that actually, that makes sense. It's exactly how the kingdom works. There's another paradox that sits at the center of our teaching today, and that is the reason that the church has to be the altar that it is, because it is only in the church, I promise you this week, you'll hear this message. Come back next week and report back to me. You will not hear this message anywhere else in your life, because in the kingdom of God, you must die to live. If you want life, you have to die. Where did I get this from? Of course, it's Jesus. Luke 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants to lose their life for me will save us. And so Jesus introduces what I, I'll just speak for myself here, the most difficult part of discipleship. That in order to live for him, I've got to take up my cross. I've got to crucify. I've got to kill my flesh. I've got to kill my desires. The word that Euchre must deny themselves. And maybe you run in a different circle. Maybe you've got a more insightful religious experience. But there's not much in my life that on a regular basis besides church that says, Kevin, you need to think less of yourself. <laughs> you remember last week I talked about this overreaching religious philosophy that, kind of, that, uh, that permeates most of our, our culture today, moralistic, therapeutic, deism. The therapeutic side of that was this idea that uh, through life, the, the goal in life is for me to be a better me. For me to find a deeper sense of who I am, and I get to decide who that is, but the therapeutic side of it is for me just to find some personal affirmation, some self-expression. And so what drives me to that would be, of course, my desires. The things that I want would then ultimately express who I am. There's actually a bit of a truth to that. But then you enter into the kingdom of God, and there's this other economy at work that says, wait a minute, no, you're actually to deny yourself. And it's not that you're thought less of, we'll talk about that, but then in the great commission, in the great commandment, we're to love God and love others. It's not that we're to think less of ourselves, but we're to think of ourselves less. And so this idea of being part of the kingdom of God, this paradox of faith where in order to find the full life, the abundant life, is there's a level of denial. It's throughout all of our faith. It's not just a matter of thinking. It's a matter of the ethics that we all have. We all, in our resources and our choices, Put the kingdom first before ourselves. Jesus says to seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all these other things will be added to you. So it's not the thing that you're giving up is necessarily bad. It just can't be first. The kingdom must be first. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about to die to live. It's this paradox of faith. And so it's why that I make sure that as I talk about the church, that I use this metaphor of an altar because I think in today's time, in today's era, the place we're in, because of moralistic, therapeutic, deism, and quite frankly, because of human nature, that we need to have a place that reminds us about that. That left to our own devices, if not disrupted, we will then go on to do the more selfish thing. It's in our nature. Any of you who have raised children ever had to teach them to say my or mine? They just seem to get there naturally, don't they, Right? It's just in our nature to want to possess and want to take and want to think of ourselves firstly. The, uh, the maturity is what actually allows us to think otherly and about other people. The same is true in our faith walk. And it's at the church that we, in fact, must be reminded of that. And not just as a matter of conviction, like we're reminded that that's the way we have to go. But then how do we do it? How do we live with the kingdom first? How do we actually deny ourselves and still not be miserable, Right? Because there's a, there's a message here about self-denial. There's a message here about dying to live. That it's just this stigmata of suffering where <clears throat> the more I give up and the more I suffer, the closer I am to Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about finding freedom. I'm talking about loosing the things that are binding us up anyway, where oftentimes sacrifice is part of that process. It's the most revealing truth that the mature believer has, and it's my experience, or my belief, even though I've talked a lot about this de-churched population, the 40 million Americans today that uh, this morning are not attending the church, but at some point in the recent past they attended church, 
And if you break down that group, about half of them are casually de-churched, people that just, they plan on coming back, they just quit. And within that half, there are some that were what they would call, I mentioned last week, cultural Christians. When you really kind of press into their understanding about what Christianity is, only 1% of them believe that Jesus is God, right? And so there really actually isn't a faith experience there. There's just a connection with an idea. I believe within that group, not holistically, this is the problem. This truth, this paradox becomes the issue because for those of you that have been following the Lord for a while, those of you that have walked through that more difficult place, this is hard. But it's not until you get to the other side of it that the doorway that you walk through, you're not saying is it a stop sign, but a speed bump and realizing that there is freedom on the other side. That on the other side of this denial, on the other side of this death to self, is the full freeness and abundance that Christ has actually promised us. So as we talk about this, I think it's probably tempting, and I, you know me, I, I, I tend to lean towards, let's just be honest with people, it's easy for us not to say this, right? I and mean, if we've got family members that, that, were, that are considering coming to church or coming to faith, I'm not sure that the most provocative or the most, the, the most attractive thing that they would hear is, hey, I want you to come to my church because I need you to come and die right? But the secret here is that you're just going to deny yourself, you know, because what, what do we hear in that, right? This kind of moralistic puritanism that says, I'm never going to have any fun for the rest of my life. All you Christians do is look down and judge people for their selfish desires. Well, it may be true in some circles, but that's not the point of this. The point of this, again, is all about freedom, and it's why the church exists to bring that truth, but then to also be the community of believers that walks us alongside of it. But, but it's not just your flesh that's a problem here. You remember in Ephesians 2, the, Paul outlines the three enemies of our soul. He talks about the, the prince of the, of, the, of the world, Satan himself. He talks about the culture we live in, kind of what is normal. That works against us. But, but he also talks about our flesh, right? But in all of that, we've got to recognize we have an enemy. That Satan is your enemy. And he does not want you to think this way. He does not want you to think about giving up as the pathway as to how you actually find things. In fact, he wants to do everything he can, especially, hear this, if he loses you to salvation, I'm talking about the enemy here, he will do everything he can to win you to mediocrity. And so your eternity is set. You're on the way to heaven. He's lost that battle. Actually, he lost it a long time ago. But in your choice and activation of your faith, he lost it personally for you and so then it's about neutralizing you, about neutering you, about keeping you in a place where you're of no danger to the kingdom of darkness. And what I have found, and I'll, this is just, I'll confess here, not condemn, is that oftentimes that happens because I'll let idols creep up in my own spirit, that I'll let other things. And it's many times the idols, you know, idols were, again, kind of using Old Testament reference, were these actual physical engraven images that pagans would pray to, the idea that we would pray to this idol and it would do something on our behalf. I'm not talking about that, although that's actually not a good thing either. What I'm talking about are idols that may be good things in your life right now. That when we're talking about the kingdom of God, it might be that God wants you to have that very thing that you're after and that you're desiring, but he doesn't want you to put that first. Because if you put it first, you'll see God through the lens of that idol where if you put Jesus first, you're going to see that desire through the lens of Jesus. That idols many times are good things that we've just gone on to make greater than God. And I think that's difficult sometimes because who could ever think that our children could be a bad thing, right? But there's been time in my life where my priorities were out of range and my children were an idol. That I made their schedule, their participation, their joy to be more of a concern than my teaching of them about what it meant to follow Jesus. There's been times when I know friends and family have put careers as an idol, or they've, they've had relationships, sometimes bad relationships as an idol, and it's those things that could have been on their own a good thing, but I, they just kept putting them in front of the Lord, and they kept drawing them away. It might be an idol. I mean, one of the good tests is if it's that thing that constantly keeps you from the fellowship of believers. If it's that one thing, and I'm not saying nobody can ever miss church. I'm not trying to condemn anybody here. But if it's that thing that disallows you and it's more important to you than being part of the faith community, it might be an idol. We might want to think about it that way. And it might not be that you have to give that thing up. You might, right? It might be that you are prepared 
to give that thing up, especially if it, if it stands between you and a more abundant, full relationship with God. And I want to remind you of the, the most true thing that I say frequently, but I want to keep saying it because it's so important. I know we're in the Halloween season, right? And so lots of ideas and imagery about Satan and devil worship and those kind of things. And that's good. We should be mindful to not do that. But my experience isn't that Satan's goal is for me to worship him, but typically Satan's goal is for me to worship me, right? And I think at that, he succeeds a lot more than the other one because he works with this cultural system that tells us to do that very thing, to put me first and me in everything, and that everything that comes in contrast or in competition with that has to take a back seat. And I'm telling you, you will not find the kingdom of God with you in the driver's seat. The kingdom of God has one king, and it ain't Kevin, and it ain't Randy, and it ain't Trenton, right? It's Jesus. God, it's your co-pilot. This is about God being in charge, Jesus being Lord of your life. And so as I'm talking this morning about the church being an altar, and I, I recognize that this might be of the five teachings I've given on the church, this is likely the most difficult one. One, because it's so nuanced, right? We can kind of talk ourselves in and out of all these topics if we really wanted to rationalize things and say, nah, that's not me, or maybe it is. But mostly because it's hard. <laughs> this stands in very, it, it stands in actually juxtaposition of my very nature that I'm called to deny myself to pick up my cross when everything inside of me says, no, put Kevin first, promote Kevin uh, above all things. It's why I think that being a follower of Jesus is the minority and not the majority. Jesus told us this. He talks about this narrower way of things. In Matthew 7, he says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. I think Jesus is preparing us for the truth that we've seen now for 2,000 years is that there's a narrow path to following him, that, that it's not the most obvious way. It's certainly not the easy way. It's not the way that we would, tall, we would go into by default, but we've got to choose him. We've got to see Jesus as the full truth, and we've got to see him as the gate, and we cannot pass through this gate and get on the other side of salvation and then say, all right, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I'll take it from here, right? But the discipleship journey, we're going to talk about that over the next few weeks, is all about us then allowing him to be Lord of our life, him to be king. And what we then find in that time is that's the best decision we'll ever make. That's where freedom is actually found. Jesus tells us this in John 10 as he's, again, keeping with this picture of gates here. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me, will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. You see, Jesus is saying it's the narrow gate. This is why most people don't do it. Only a few will do it. But if you're going to do it, I'm the gate. I'm the truth. I'm the light, that no one comes to the Father except through me. And not only then can you defeat your enemy, Satan himself, it's not about just getting by, but there will be, in some interpretations, call it an abundant life. And just let me kind of be honest here, more revealing, I guess. One of the things I worry about in my preaching, and I try to take in context of all the things I teach, both in terms of content and tone, and, and you, you, know, you don't have to be around here long to pick up on the idea that I really lean heavily and, and towards preparing people for the difficulties of faith. I, I, I want a church. I, I, want a, I want a group of people. I want the people that God has placed in my responsibility to be very mindful that this is not an easy journey. Because I think one of the things that could happen is if we don't prepare people for the fact that this is a countercultural, counterintuitive life, that the minute they run up against that difficult thing, they think God's mad at them, or they think there's something wrong with them. And so I, I will lean heavily into that. One of the problems with that, and I'll just say that I think I am guilty of this, is that I don't talk enough about the abundant life. I, I don't talk about the freedom 
because I want you to be prepared for the negative, but I also want you to make sure I understand that there is a picture here of abundance, of fullness, of realness that you will not get unless you pass through that narrower gate. And that's why we're so intent here when we talk about inviting people to faith to not use the superficial things about great music or a great building or all these kind of things that are fun to have and nice to have, but they're not going to keep you close to Jesus. We want to talk about the deeper things of faith. We want to talk about the eternal, time-tested truths that will actually help us not just get through that narrow gate, but to see that there is freedom. There is abundant life on the other side of that. I think one of the benefits we have here, despite sometimes my maybe one-sided teaching on the topic, is that we have so many people here, and I don't know the percentage, but we have a very large percentage of people that attend the village that are actively in recovery, that have been through recovery or in recovery, leading recovery. They're somehow involved with recovery. And if you spend any time with those folks, they'll tell you they, exactly what I'm telling you right now. They will say that that road that I was on before was not abundant. It was not full. I'm experiencing a new freedom now. I had to pass through a very narrow gate to get there. But in that passing of the narrow gate, I had to unload some things along the way. Some things that I thought I could not live without. Some people I thought I could not live without. Some things that I'm certain that I needed, but when I gave them up, when I denied myself, when I realized that thing that I was obsessing over, that I thought so important, I suffered so much that I had to give it up, at that point, I found freedom. I'm like, wait a minute. Something's been lying to me. Something's been telling me that that thing that I have obsessed and fought and tried to achieve was not nearly as giving. It's not the fullness that was promised. It was reading this morning. Um, Matthew Perry just died yesterday. They found him dead. Uh, he's 54. So you're younger than me. You guys, you've seen the, the series Friends. Uh, he, he wrote a book a year ago, and he's very open uh, about his uh, struggle with uh, addiction, alcohol and drugs. Been in and out of the hospital several times, nearly died. I don't know what, how he passed yesterday, so I don't, I don't know what the circumstances are. Um, but one of the things he talked about in his book, um, it was in an article, I hadn't read the book, but in the article I read this morning, was he, at one point he made a deal with God. He said, God, if you make me famous, I'll do anything. And in his book, he talked about what a, what, what a terrible idea of what, what that meant for God, that he was willing to do anything, but I just want this one thing, God. And the interesting thing, part of his life, as he writes about it, was that, in fact, he did achieve that. <laughs> he got very famous. And in achieving that very thing that he was willing to give everything for to do, he found out it's not that good. In fact, there's a lot of dangers associated with it. And I, I don't know what your one prayer is. I don't know what your one obsession is. I'm not sure what your addiction might be. But I would imagine that there's many of us that have prayed, God, if I just could find that spouse. God, if I could just find, if, if my child would just do this. God, if you would just give me this kind of a job. And then every now and then he gives it to us and we get there. I'm like, you know, wasn't that great? It wasn't what I thought. And that's where so many people then turn to other sources because what's inside of them is a void that they thought this thing was going to fill but it never filled it and each one of us is this god-sized hole that only christ is going to fill and we do all kinds of creative things damaging things to fill it with ourself and so this morning as i'm talking about dying to live i know that i've got a better audience than most pastors have this morning because I know many of you have experienced that exact reality. You have died to live. Many of you have physically died. Many of you have come through that narrow gate as a matter of not choice, but of, of realizing that I'm out of options. But on the other side of that, you're living a life more free now than you ever thought you could live. But you had to pass through some difficulty to get there. And for the rest of us that maybe haven't experienced it at the level that some have, I want to tell you that same economy is at work, that same process, that God is very interested in us not having any idols in our life. What's the first commandment? I'm the Lord God who brought you out of Egypt. You'll have no other gods before me. That's the starting point. He's not negotiating that. 
And he's not that because he's a controlling deity. (laughs) He knows that he created you, that he made you in his image. He knows what's best for you. And for you and I, we are best, we are most fulfilled. Frankly, we are safest under his direction. It's when we go off on our own, like the prodigal son, that we find all kinds of trouble to get into, but freedom is only fully found in him. And so I'm going to keep taking this risk. I'm going to keep preaching uh, the, the, the kingdom economy uh, that says that you've got to die to live. I believe we live in a time that that is so necessary. It's like it's always been necessary, but I believe we, we've elevated self to such a high level here. We, we've elevated self to a place of deity that I need to talk about it a lot because if I don't, you're going to be discipled by something else and you're going to think that you are the most important thing in the world. And the freedom we find is that we're not, that of course that's Jesus we're talking about. So the way we talk about this, again, I say the same thing over and over because important things are, impo- are, are, are helpful to be redundant, is we talk about, this will be on the back of your bulletins if you want to write these down, I dare you. The three hard S's of faith. The three hard S's of faith. And I say this in, 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 uh, in, in contrast to the three easy C's, comfort, convenience, and control. Like that's just what comes easy to us, right? We just naturally go to what's comfortable. We just naturally go what's easiest, what's convenient. And we just tend to be really obsessed with always being in control of our life, right? That's kind of our default. If we want to stand against that, because that is not the kingdom way, then we're going to have to pass through this narrow gate of the three hard S's. What is the first hard S? The first hard F is sacrifice. We've got to give up. That's where I think this imagery of altar in the church is so important because it's at, I'll tell you, at this church, you're going to hear, you got to sacrifice. you got to give up. Now, what does that look like? It depends on the individual, but I can tell you that the thing that you need to give up the most is the thing that maybe you're holding on to the most, right? That's why, you know, money is such a hard thing. That's why, that's why so many people struggle to find the kind of financial abundance because there's a, there's a law of soaping, sowing and reaping in the kingdom. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians. Those who sow sparingly, reap sparingly. Those who sow generously, reap generously. Now, I'm not going to walk over this line into the prosperity gospel, but I can tell you there is a spiritual truth at work that for those that are generous and take risk and sow seeds into the kingdom, God blesses them as a result of it. I've not just read it, I've experienced it. The problem with that is that so many times believers get tied up in fear or they decide to take a risk and assume that if I give generously, God's going to give me a Cadillac or a Lexus or a Tesla, whatever your particular car is. That's not the abundance he's promising necessarily. He might, but I'm telling you there's much more important, much more valuable things than Cadillacs, and all of it's built around our willingness to sacrifice our money, but then also what is the most important thing any of us have? Our time. And so you hear us talk so much about our willingness to give up our time and our money. These are the things that all of us, I'm the same way. God has done a tremendous things in my life as it relates to financial generosity. I love, I love to be generous. I'm very stingy with my time. You better have a really good reason if you want to get on my schedule. Sometimes that's a sin. Sometimes that's a problem for me. Sometimes that's something that I obsess over because I feel like I've got so much to do that if I do this other thing that's not that important, Jesus is going to get behind this week. (laughs) That's sin. That's me not sacrificing. That's me not living in the kingdom economy and saying, wait a minute, Kevin, all these things you think you've got to do, let's talk about where you really ought to be spending your time because God can do anything with, with just a little bit. So sacrifice is the first of the three S's. The second is surrender. Surrender. And, and I'm specifically, when I talk about surrendering here, you could even insert the word submit here. I'm talking about surrendering our desires and our, and our will. That God will absolutely give you the desires of your heart. But, but he'll change them first. He'll align your desires with his. That's That's the abundant life, folks. That's when you're pursuing the very thing that God puts in your heart to do, and you've got a pretty good idea it might be God's will when it's not something that you would have chosen on your own. 
that many times God is calling us into places of surrender and submission to, and obedience to him. And it looks like from the outside in it doesn't make sense, but our, our heart is aligned with him and we want to do that thing that doesn't make sense. I'm not talking about being irresponsible here, but I'm talking about us doing things that don't serve us first, that actually do serve other people. That's the surrender of the will we're talking about. It's also the surrender of the will. Again, I'll talk about those that have been through recovery, that much of what their addiction or their hurt, their habit, their hang-up is rooted in a desire. There's something that they've been in pursuit of, and when they didn't get it or on the way to get it, they picked up all of these ugly habits along the way that now have to be dealt with, and we've got to not just surrender that solution, we've got to surrender the problem. And that's what happens so much in our step studies and as you, as you pick up a, a sponsor is you realize the thing that brought you to recovery was just the beginning. That there's a whole lot of deeper work that has to happen and it usually, I don't know, sponsors tell me if I'm wrong here, I'll just say it almost always involves surrender. We, we are control freaks. We will do anything to have full control of our own lives and we live in a world that tells us that's a goal. I'm saying that we can trust in Jesus, that he gives us choices, he gives us the ability to participate in his will, but we've got to understand firstly what his desire and will is, and that secondly, underneath of that is what I've got to surrender to him, which is mine. Sacrifice, surrender, this is the toughest of the tough. <laughs> uh, the third of the hard S's is Suffering. Suffering. This is the one I would not include if I had the option. But it's been too much of my personal experience. And the scriptures are really clear that this is part of the pathway. Apostle Paul, uh, Romans 5, 3. He says that we, we should glorify in our sufferings in one part of Romans. But he also says suffering breeds perseverance. Perseverance breeds character. Character breeds hope. Get that. Suffering is connected to hope. How in the world could my suffering bring hope? Well, I'll just tell you from my experience that my suffering oftentimes is about God taking me through some very difficult things and it allows me to realize I'm hoping in things that are not him. I've put my faith in temporal things, not eternal things. And that there are times in my life that the only way that I'm going to let that go is through difficulty that I'm not much for volunteering the hard stuff, that oftentimes God will allow suffering, and I'm not saying whether he causes it or whether he uses it. What Paul said, Romans 8, 28, God works all things to the good for those that love him. There are times when I believe that God would allow. We see in the story of Job, God, Satan comes and says, can I tempt him? God says, go ahead. Suffering was allowed by God. So it may happen that way, but we should not assume that just because we're going through a difficult time that God is mad at us. That some of the most freeing times in my discipleship journey has become on the other side of it, that at that moment I could not have told you. And that's why I think this theology of suffering is so missed in the church today and so critical, because it's rare that in the middle of the suffering that we have that perspective. But I can tell you, and looking back at different seasons of my life, or having walked through seasons of suffering with many of you, in that moment, it's not clear but then as we get a week away, a month away, 10 years away, you're saying, you know, I'm glad I went through that. I'm glad I walked that narrow path. I'm glad God took me. In that time, I realized the thing that I was holding on to was not the thing that I needed, that God loves us enough to allow the difficulty and suffering in our life to grow us in the likeness of Christ. And so we've just got to be accepting of it. And at the minimum, if you're prepared for it, your first thought when suffering comes, may not be God's mad at me. It might be that he actually loves you and he's got a tremendous plan for you. And on the other side of that plan is some perseverance and character that he's growing in you. And for that is why Paul says we should glory in our suffering. But, but I think there's a, a piece to this we just got to be honest about, though. It, I'm imagining you know, just based on personal experience and what the data tells us about why people either don't go to church or don't follow Jesus or why people that used to now don't. 
and a very high percentage of them, it comes down to this question of suffering. And I don't mean that they're suffering and they didn't like it. I mean it's difficult for them to reconcile suffering with a good God. That they've been through enormous personal pain. That they've been through loss that's only imaginable. They see a world that is violent and evil and broken and say, you keep talking about this good God, I don't see it. I think those are good questions. <laughs> I think those are questions worth asking. And had I not had the truth of Scripture to help me and form me on it, I would have that same kind of question. But it is in the discipleship journey, it is in the community of faith, and I believe the only place where we can begin to reconcile the suffering in the world. Firstly, because I believe God calls us to bring relief to the suffering. We're not proud of the problem, we're part of the solution. But I think even deeper than that, it helps us make sense of suffering. Is God really just this far-off, distant deity that just puts us all into place, spins the earth like a top, and then just lets us go, and just, you know, whatever evil happens, happens? It's deism. That's, that's the moralistic, therapeutic deism part of that. I don't think that's it. I think that's an apathetic God. We do not serve an apathetic God. What we do serve is a, a God who did something very scandalous in the beginning. And I think we, we have to imagine that the suffering of the world, the suffering that exists now, it has to be seen through this lens. And that, that very scandalous thing that he did, that frankly, if I was God, I would not have done, <laughs> is that he put in every one of us, we're firstly an image bearer of him, but then also inside of that, he's given every one of us a free will. Every one of us have a choice. Satan was given a choice, right? At one point, he was the most adored of the angels and rejected God out of a matter of choice. And it is through free will, because God could have made a creation that only had the option to love him. If you had children that only had the option to love you, could you ever really know that they loved you? No, your children have the option to love you. And in that free will that they have, they go on to do some evil things. <laughs> Parents, they make us suffer oftentimes, right? That's the scandalous truth of creation, is that God gives us free will. It was through the free will of Adam and Eve that gave over to the free will of Satan that evil introduced into the world, and that Satan for that time he wrote completely chaos over mankind. He was defeated at the cross. Absolutely defeated, but we still live in this time in between. So for those of us who follow Jesus, all power and authority has been given to him. Now he's given that to us. We still have that, we still have that uh, free will, but that authority exists inside of every believer. But the reality is suffering is still happening. Bad things are still going on, but it is only through the lens of faith and creation that we understand that Satan is the ultimate gaslighter. <laughs> he goes on to wreak all the havoc. Death is death because of him. Disease is disease because of him. Violence is violence because of him. Broken relationships are broken relationships because of him. And in his masterful way, he convinces all of us that God did it. And then we say, God, why can't you do something about it? And God says, because I chose you to do something about it. You see, it's in that picture of suffering that we admit that the world is a broken place. We admit that bad things happen to good people. We admit that it's difficult for us to reconcile a good God with an evil world and not only are we given the hindsight of saying, well, wait a minute, because of that difficulty, I'm this way, we're also given the foresight of eternity. Because it's the only hope I give to a parent, and I've done this way too many times, that has buried a child. It's the only hope I give. I, I give them nothing out of my personal experience that says I understand because I don't. I, I, I give them nothing to hold on to that says this will be better in this life because it won't. I give them the most important thing that they need to know, and that is this is just temporary. It is loss. It is real. It's even cruel, but it's temporary. 
You see, for the follower of Jesus, we are given eternity. And so for that loved one that you're separated from right now, they died in Christ, you die in Christ, we have eternity together. And that does not make the 70 or 80 or 90 years we have on earth any better. They're still suffering. We will still suffer, but they are there waiting for you. And so when I'm asked to reconcile the suffering of the world, I can only do that through the lens of eternity, and it's what I promise you. And frankly, it's what I think we have to offer our friends, our family, and our coworkers is that we serve a God of eternity. We serve a God who isn't just promising an abundant life now, but he's, he, he's promising you the heaven that we talked about over this past summer. We, we also serve a God that isn't just waiting for eternity uh, to bring us that freedom, that he's doing that work right now in each of our lives. And Kyle talked about this earlier, this, this idea that much of this pathway of following Jesus involves difficulty. And frankly, some of the difficulty we have wouldn't be that difficult if we weren't walking that narrow path. We could go back to just kind of turning, putting the blinders back on and not sure if we'd ever really know this is suffering. But because you follow the Lord, and I think this will continue, I think it's going to increase, that following Jesus will continue to cost us. Church, I want you to be prepared for that. But we have eternity. We have the time-tested truth of faith to rely on to say this is the right and narrow path. And right now, for those of you that are going through that difficult time and you can't make sense of the suffering you're going through, you've sacrificed, you've surrendered, you don't see Jesus in any of it. I just, at that moment, I promise you, just hold on. Hold on, but be part of the altar. Be part of the church. Be part of the community of believers that have said, you know what, I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I know something similar, and this was the outcome of that. So hold on, let me pray with you. Let me be with you. Let me teach you. That's why we need the church, folks. But so often Satan convinces us in the middle of that suffering, get away, isolate, hide, be alone. But he prowls around like a lion seeking to devour And so for you this morning, as we head into communion, I want to pray for you that the sacrifice, the suffering, and the surrendering that you're going to bring to the altar this morning, that God's going to bring you freedom. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we preach hard truth this morning. Uh, we, We preach a truth that is eternal and it is freeing, but nonetheless difficult. And so Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit would rest on this place as we head into this time of communion and ministry, that you would speak words of knowledge, you would speak words of encouragement, that we would encourage each other and receive direct encouragement from your Holy Spirit. God, that whatever the difficulty, whatever the pain that's being experienced, that God, you come in and you not just bring relief, but you bring purpose to it. You show us the very place that you're taking us as a result of us growing in closeness to you. Jesus, we do all of these things because we love you so dearly. It's in your name we pray. Amen.